50,000 people used to live here. Now it's a ghost town. And so echo the famous words of Macmillan in an intro that we will probably never forget. Call of Duty 4, a video game we have all come to know and love within the Call of Duty community for its introduction of the innovative create a class feature, fast paced multiplayer maps, and last but not least, an engaging single player experience. It's the FNG, sir. Go easy on him, sir. It's his first day in the regiment. Right. What the hell kind of name is Soap, eh? How to Muppet like you pass selection? The game was released just over 15 years ago, and it has developed a decently sized speedrunning community around it over the years. Today, we'll be diving deeper into the history of Call of Duty 4 and figuring out how a few bounces broke Call of Duty 4 speedrunning. Call of Duty 4 had a slow start in its early days, as people did not seem to care about speedrunning it. And who could blame them? It did have an addicting multiplayer that really caught people's attention at the time. There were some segmented runs done by a few runners, but this video will be focusing solely on single segment runs and the strategies used in those. After seeing virtually no single segment speedruns done for over 5 years of its release, the game would finally receive its first proper single segment speedrun in 2014. Before getting into that run, and the main section of this video with all the other interesting runs and strategies used, we need to understand a few basic movement mechanics that Call of Duty 4 speedrunners use regularly. First one of these is called Strafe Jumping, or Strafing for short. If you have played the older Call of Duties, this term will most likely be familiar to you, at least to a certain extent. In Call of Duty 4, our default sprint movement speed without a movement speed penalty is 285 units. With strafe jumping, this can be increased to speeds as high as even 400 units. I will not get too in depth with how strafing works in this video, as it is a long topic even on its own. To put it shortly, strafe jumping has the player move sideways with either the A or the D key, while simultaneously sprinting forward and jumping. The mouse movement you see here is what gives you the speed when combined with the correct sideways movement key. If strafing from the left side, this key is D. If from the right, this key is A. Now with strafe jumping out of the way, we will take a look at elevators. If you have played Call of Duty 4 multiplayer before, you might have seen people on top of extremely tall buildings and even some invisible barriers, such as this one right here. Chances are, these players have done an elevator to get to that spot. Elevators happen when the runner gets in between the state of not being able to stand up and being able to stand up. The game essentially checks if the player should be allowed to stand, and if they are under an object, that answer is no. Once the player moves out from beneath the object, the answer is yes. There is one pixel or one unit, as they are called in Call of Duty, on the edge of the object that the game considers as meeting both of these conditions. This results in the game getting confused and elevating the player onto the top of the object that they are under. And this is what a successful elevator looks like. One final mechanic that we need to cover are bounces. Bounces are only majorly present in Call of Duty 4, and they happen when a player hits a slanted surface with a high velocity. The game converts the player's downwards velocity into upwards velocity, and sends the player flying. As a good rule of thumb, the more velocity, the bigger the bounce. There are some exceptions to this, but we will not need to cover those today. Now that we have a basic understanding of strafing, elevators, and bounces, we're set to proceed on with exploring the timeline of Call of Duty 4 speedrunning. On the 28th of January, 2014, a runner going by the name Lexos published the first single segment any percent speedrun of Call of Duty 4 
with a time of 2 hours, 1 minute and 59 seconds. While Lexus's run was fast at the time, it did not feature that many time saves or skips, and instead mostly relied on efficiently completing all the objectives given. The few time saves the run had though were all major and saved tens of seconds, if not minutes each. As expected, Lexus completes the prologue and Act 1 without any major issues and enters Act 2 at a respectable time of 1 hour, 5 minutes and 7 seconds. The first skip Lexos had in his run is right in the beginning of Act 2 on the level Safe House. In this mission, you are tasked with capturing Al-Assad, who is believed to be hiding in a small village located in Azerbaijan. Playing the level normally, the game has the player clearing the village in a house-to-house -house manner until you are down to just one of two options. Al-Assad can be either in the barn or in the house located on the western edge of the village. This is where Lexos does what we call the barn skip or the safe house skip. What makes this skip so awesome is that it was originally found even as early as 2009. It was found by a runner called Sami Nego Reinikainen during his efforts on creating the first segmented run of the game. So, how does this skip work, and what does Lexos do to execute it? First off, Lexos runs to the barn, taking the route he feels is the fastest, and hits a trigger that practically tells the game, I cleared the barn. This way, Al-Assad spawns in the western house immediately, and the runner can just run there and wait for Captain Price to initiate the capture sequence. This skip is extremely easy to do, and just requires the knowledge that you can complete the objectives in any order you wish, even if they do not show up on your compass. There is a small risk of dying here due to heavy enemy fire and some explosive barrels, but most of the time the runner should survive this section with ease. What makes knowing this skip worthwhile is the fact that clearing all the other houses will take an upward of approximately 3 minutes even with good movement and learned AI spawns. So in short, this skip shaves off around 3 to 4 minutes of the run. After finishing up safe house with style, Lexos enters probably the most iconic level of the entire game and maybe even all of Call of Duty, all gillied up. You play as Lieutenant Price, who is under the command of Captain Macmillan. Casually played, this mission has you follow Macmillan and obey his orders. Lexos had other things in mind though. Lexos does play most of the level normally, but just before the intimidating crawling scene, the community had figured out that you can crouch along the bushes and go undetected by the chopper. This allows Lexos to get closer to the crawling section before it is initiated in the code. As far as we know, this is tied to Macmillan's pace. This did not save any time though, as far as I can tell from the video. This is mostly due to the fact that Lexos played safe and decided not to engage any enemies while Macmillan was still crawling. After taking out a couple of enemies and gracefully hopping his way forward, Lexos does a skip called the Container Skip. This saves a massive amount of time due to skipping the bloody convention the game would normally want you to do. The Bloody Convention is a fairly long stealth section with a lot of enemies. It relies heavily on the player following every command given to them, and this would be a huge time loss if it needed to be done. After the Bloody Convention, it is a sprint for the finish line, as there is an end trigger on this level that does not require any objectives to be completed for the mission to end. For the rest of the run, Lexos has a few more tricks up his sleeve. They shoot the cave's arm off early, before the wind calms down, at the beginning of one shot, one kill, saving about half a minute. Near the end of the mission, they place Macmillan down in the correct spot before taking out the last enemy patrolling the area. This allows them to pick up Macmillan earlier, when he is supposed to be carried to the chopper, saving some more precious time. The final noteworthy thing about this run is placing claymores down at the beginning of heat. This essentially spawn traps the enemies at a later time, 
allowing the runner to progress a bit faster through the level. This run would set the baseline for the future, and all world records after Lexus's run would have all of these skips and tricks utilized in them. Lexus's world record was short-lived however, as just three days later on the 31st of January 2014, a runner called the Twitch Cop would cut their time by almost four minutes and achieve the world's first sub two hour run. He managed to beat Call to the 4 in just one hour, 58 minutes and three seconds. The run is significantly faster because of two new skips that Twitch Cop used. The first new skip is on all gillied up and it cuts even more intended parts out of the mission. Instead of progressing the level normally up until the bloody convention, like Lexos did, Twitch Cop did an elevator on the shack to get out of bounds and skip the crawling section trigger right after the church. This skip alone saves a couple of minutes, and when combined with the skip Lexos used, all gillied up can be completed in just over 2 minutes with current movement knowledge. To stress how important these all gillied up skips are, let me recap all you need to do to complete this mission as intended. First, you need to eliminate all the enemies in the first house or sneak past it, snipe the guards outside the church and the one in the church tower. Next up, you need to hide from the helicopter and slowly crawl your way forward on the open field. After this, you either sneak by these enemies after the crawling section, or you take them out. When that is all done, you still need to clear the container area and wait for Macmillan. And we aren't even past the bloody convention yet. Once Macmillan shows up to open the door to the bloody convention, you still have a long sneaking section ahead of you. After which, you are pretty free to run to the end. Using this type of strategy, Completing all gillied up would take around 7.5 minutes. That is 5 minutes of time saved if using the two skips. How insane is that? As much as I'd love to spend more time talking about all gillied up, let's move on. On top of the skip Twitch Cup used on all gillied up, he also found a new way of destroying the machine gun nests on The Sins of the Father. This is the mission where you chase Viktor Zakaev in hopes of capturing him. Destroying the MG nests with an RPD saves just under 2 minutes if you have good movement. This is mostly because the helicopter that is supposed to destroy them is extremely slow and takes some time to catch up to the runner. These two new skips allowed Twitch Cop to get the world's first sub 2 hour Call to 4 run. This record stood for about 5 months until a new runner called Mr. All-Powerful shook the boards by beating Twitch Cop's run by almost 9 minutes. All-Powerful's run only introduced minor changes to the routing and one new skip, but those tiny improvements proved effective in making the run a whole lot more consistent. They allowed him to gain small amounts of time in every section that all added up to a massive amount of time saved over Twitch Cop's run. The one new skip All Powerful had was on the map Blackout. Instead of going under the bridge from the furthest left opening, he would instead take the path to the most right. This causes Price and Gas to teleport, saving tens of seconds. All Powerful's run is considered to be one of the most important runs of the game, mostly because it proved that consistency is key when it comes to strategy but also for the fact that it stayed as the world record for over two years. All Powerful's run would not be beaten until late 2016. From 2016 to 2018, the runners had one goal in mind, getting that number down from a sub-150 to possibly even a sub-140. The first run towards that goal came from no other than Jimmy13 Nitzo. On the 28th of September 2016, Jimmy13 Nitzo finally beat Mr. All Powerful's time and improved the world record by about 2.5 minutes, getting a 146.41. The time saved is mostly thanks to Jimmy's quicker execution of previous tricks. The world record would receive minor improvements to it from Oboe's OP and Flap Jackerson, 
cutting down the time first to a 146.39, then a year later to a 146.08. Something worth noting about Oboe's OP's run is that at the beginning of Heat, Oboe's OP snipes the enemies first and then set up claymores. This is the correct order for progressing the level as fast as possible. This saves however much time you need to set up the claymores, so roughly around 15 to 20 seconds. Less than a month later from Flap Trackerson's run, I would go on to get a 14403 with some minor improvements of my own. My time saves mostly came from even faster execution and more efficient strategies, utilization of flashbangs to help with risky sections, and optimizing weapon pickups were the few things that really helped with taking calculated risks. This showed in my run only having one death. Nine months later, Flap Trackerson went ahead and claimed the world record back with a 14206. His execution was even faster and this was the first ever deathless run as a world record for Call of Duty 4. After Flap Trackerson's 142, the community went quiet once again. People thought that a near optimal run had been reached with the current full game strategies. And in a way, the community was right. It would have taken a lot of effort to achieve a 141, even though the goal was so close, just 7 seconds away. There was a solution to this problem though, a skip considered too hard by the community to ever pull off in a full game run. The skip I'm talking about is the flashy Charlie Don't Serve skip, or in short, the CDS skip. It was discovered in early 2018, but it had only seen usage in the individual level category. The skip requires extreme precision, even more so the old version of it that I'm about to show here. The first part of the skip is fairly simple. We want to mantle our way onto the top of this roof in the beginning of the mission. From this roof, we will then hit a bounce from this car to fly over the wall. This skips a barrier that would otherwise force us to head to the left towards the first building we breach with Lieutenant Vasquez. You might notice that we are actually in bounds, but just a bit further in the mission. The next part of the skip happens just before we get to the broadcast station. We want to jump onto a rooftop once again, and this time also pick up an RPG. Now, we do some jumping and execute this precise RPG strafe jump. The RPG gives you some extra jump height if you time it well with your jump. You would think that this skip would be over soon and that the hardest part was done. Well, you'd be wrong. As next, you'd have two precise bounces to hit. First, from this broken wall, and then from this car. After you have done all these tricks without failing, you are rewarded with a faster Charlie Don't Surf than normally would be possible. All you have to do is head upstairs to the final door. After reaching the door, the mission will end approximately 50 seconds later. We ask ourselves, and what for? How much time does it save? Well. Charlie Don't Serve Skip saves an astonishing 3 minutes or so. Now you might be wondering, why am I mentioning this skip if it's too hard for full game runs? That is because the community would be proven wrong. And by who? No other than Flap Trackerson. Flap Trackerson would go on to implement this extremely hard CDS skip into his full game run, and eventually also complete a run with this skip. On the 10th of August 2019, his time would come down to a 139.32. I remember seeing this run in my verification list and looking at it in awe. Someone had used Charlie Don't Surf Skip in a full game run and gotten the first sub 140 with it. I was sure that this record would stand for a long, long time, as there was seemingly no way to beat it without the Charlie Don't Surf Skip. And in a way, that would be the case. It would take one year for someone to beat Flap Trackerson's run and to start a new era in Call of Duty 4 discoveries. 2020 was a big year for Call of Duty 4 speedrunning. A lot of new strategies had been brewing up, and someone would eventually put those into practice and throw together a full game run. 
that runner would be myself. My run's time was not impressive by any means, as I only beat Flap Trackerson's run by a measly second, but it did feature a lot of new discoveries from the community that are used even in today's runs. The first new discovery was a teleport near the end of Crew Expendable, which saves a few seconds. This teleport abuses AI animations and how they play. In short, you want to look away from this container and stand within this trigger that causes Gas to start his animation. If Gas gets stuck or stops even for a millisecond, he will teleport and open the crate immediately. Gas opening the container initiates the dialogue that progresses the level further. The next skip is actually on the next level, Blackout. After we meet Kamarov and the Loyalists, we travel up this hill and wait for these two machine gunners to spawn. We kill them as fast as possible, so we have time to execute a sprint elevator on this window frame. Now you might wonder how a sprint elevator actually works. Let me explain. We know that to hit an elevator, you need to reach the state between being able to stand up underneath an object and not being able to stand at the same time. We move our crosshair ever so slightly to the left, move forwards and hold our sprint key so that we are moving at a snail's pace towards the left. Sprinting helps us in the sense that it automatically makes us stand up when we have a space above our heads. So logically, when we move left extremely slowly, we will at some point hit that sweet spot that the elevator requires. That is when our character will think, I can now sprint, so let's stand up. Now when we hit the sprint elevator, we're forced to do yet another elevator. This time, it is an easy one, because we're already standing in the correct spot. All we must do is jump, crouch and uncrouch, and we should be on top of this burning building. As a small bit of information for the next part, in Call of Duty, enemies won't spawn if you have direct line of sight to their spawn. There are some exceptions to this, but this is generally how it works. From this rooftop, we drop down and rush the enemy spawn near this power station. We reached this position so early that the game barely had time to spawn any enemies. We finish off the few enemies that the game did manage to spawn and backtrack slightly to get ready to complete the next objective. The skip would prove itself useful in later runs, but here, due to lack of experience with it, it would barely save any time, if any. More on this topic a bit later. Next level we have ahead of us is Charlie Don't Surf, and we have to execute the scary Charlie Don't Surf skip. Luckily for us, a runner called Shadecam came up with a partial solution for tackling the skip consistently in full game. After performing the first car bounce normally and closing in on the broadcast station, he had a different strategy in mind than the one previously used. He would not jump onto the rooftops. Instead, he would head for this palm tree located in front of the broadcast station. He discovered that you could perform a sprint elevator up the barrier of this palm tree, which completely skips the hard RPG jump I showed earlier, and the difficult bounce right after it. You would only need to do the one final bounce to skip Charlie Don't Surf. Within the community, we call this elevator the Tree Elevator. The name is simplistic, yet everyone knows what it is. That goes to show the importance of it. With this massive discovery, full game runs were finally enjoyable if you wanted to include CDS skip. The major time cut this skip provided was a resurgence to the community. The game saw many older runners return to improve their PB times, but we also saw plenty of new faces joining the grind for faster times than ever seen before. Shortly after Shadecam's discovery, I would find a way to make the car bounce even easier. This would involve picking up the RPG from the rooftops and using it to boost our bounce, getting us enough height to make it to the window with nearly any kind of bounce. Do not get me wrong, CDS skip was still not easy even with this new discovery. It took a bunch of practice and some resets, but I did manage to hit it in this run on the first try. With CDS cleanly out of the way, we enter Bog. Here, our general understanding of the level had gotten better, 
But the one exciting thing was this teleport at the end of Bog that can save about 10 seconds. In short, we avoid having any direct line of sight to our teammates, which causes them to teleport to the final objective. After hitting the objective trigger and some dialogue, the level ends and we enter Hunted. On Hunted, we put our grenades to good use. Ever seen a soldier take out a helicopter with a grenade? If you hadn't before, now you have. Using grenades instead of the Stinger missiles, the AI will not stop in the barn, and Captain Price does not have to wait for gas to enter the barn. Instead, he goes straight for this door and opens it. This strategy can save a lot of time depending on the order of your teammates. If gas is before Price, the time save is only a few seconds, but if Price is first, the skip will save approximately 10 seconds. The next mission, Death from Above, was also solved in 2020, but this mission isn't the most exciting to watch, so I will save you from the long explanation. In short, we figured out the optimal times to kill the enemies and progress the mission as fast as possible. There are these kill counts that the game tracks. Once we kill enough enemies within a certain time period, we don't lose time. The next small time save we have is on Shock and Daw. The community figured out that we could enter this helicopter early if we hit this invisible trigger on the ground here, and another one pointed by our compass. After hitting the second trigger, the game just teleports you onto the grenade launcher. While this was used in Flap Trackerson's run in 2019, he entered the helicopter too early, which caused him to lose time rather than gaining it. When done correctly, this saves a few seconds. While this might not sound like much, on a level like Shock and Door, gaining time is no easy feat, as it is mostly an auto-scroller. The rest of the run goes as expected when comparing the older runs. If you are a seasoned Call to the Four veteran, you might have noticed that all these new discoveries were in Act 1. This time period, and to some degree this run, were really the turning point for the evolution of Act 1 as more and more discoveries would soon be made about this rather unoptimized part of the game. Over the next few months, the world record would trade hands four times between myself, Flap Jackerson, Blue Target, and someone well known for his other impressive records, Kluger. Before we go on, I want to take a brief moment to bring up Kluger's importance regarding the future of this game and Call of Duty speedrunning as a whole. You might have seen his MW2 pit run, or maybe his 8.85 FNG training course in 4 tries. For all those that know him, and for all those who don't, I want to be straightforward about this. He brings competition and pushes limits on any COD game he touches. To see him pick up COD 4, I knew that this game would get its world record improved, but I would severely underestimate by how much. As I mentioned before, the world record traded hands many times within a few months. First, Flap Trackerson got a 138.22, but as I mentioned before, Kluger was about to join the party with his first Call to the Four world record. Kluger would enter the last mission with varying playtime, no fighting in the war room, one minute and four seconds ahead of the world record. He was about to achieve the world record, and with a significant margin as well. But that is when disaster struck. In before? Okay. <laughs> Wait. How do I stop this? He's soft locked. But why? What had he done wrong? When you enter the room and Price is supposed to close the door, the game checks that all of your allies and the player itself are in the room. This is so Price does not close the door on the player or on Griggs. There is a nasty bug though. Seemingly at random, the game fails to despawn one ally from a previous section and Price never closes the door. Sometimes, this bug is irreversible but other times the game succeeds at despawning the ally after dying and loading the last checkpoint. We still do not know what causes the game to not despawn the ally, 
which makes this soft lock extremely brutal as it is located at the very end of the game. This is a thing that can happen? This is a thing that can happen? What? What? What are you doing? Dude, why? Why? Why did I soft lock, dude? Why? Why, dude? Why? <laughs> dude! Why now? Why? Oh my god! Oh my god! This very soft lock cost Kluger the world record, but he still managed to PB just by a few seconds. He would not be discouraged though, and would soon claim a time of 137.23. About two months later, a fairly new runner, Blue Target, struck with a 137.16. However, Kluger swiftly took back the world record just two weeks later with a 136.59. The world record would eventually be knocked down even further, but who got the run, and just how fast was it? The world record finally settled in the hands of Kluger, who knocked the time down to a 135.54. But how did these three players exactly manage to bring the time down by such a large amount from my 139.31? I mentioned earlier that we would get back to the elevator skip on Blackout, and that is what we're going to look at first. These new runs demonstrated a better understanding of the Blackout elevator skip, after the skip, we were supposed to shoot these enemies on the ground, so that the enemies that spawn later in this room, spawn much earlier. Only after we have killed the enemies on the ground, do we rush the enemy spawn near the power station. This saves a decent amount of time, approximately 10-20 to 20 seconds on an average blackout run. The next big optimization that the community found was on the level safe house. We knew that getting Captain Price to the last door was important, but we had no way of controlling Price's movement because we were occupied with strafing to the barn, so the safe house skip would work in the first place. How about some rockets? said a man called Fred. He found out that you could make Price more consistent with his pathing by calling in an airstrike on this specific spot of the rock. This was not 100% consistent, but it was much better than having a near 0% chance at a fast price. And you thought that Fred was done? Nope. He also found out that you can mantle the shack and all gillied up, instead of having to do a crouch elevator. This would save a lot of time, as the elevator could sometimes be tricky and take over 30 seconds to do. While most of the time this was not the case, and you could hit the elevator in under 20 seconds, it was still a great feeling to have a method that you could do in just under 5 seconds, nearly 100% of the time. And to think that all this time, a much easier way to do the first skip on all Gilead Up was so close. It does make me wonder, what other things do we just not know about? Even though a lot of the things you see in Call of Duty runs seem obvious today, that probably wasn't the case a few years ago. Anyhow, moving on. Heading into Act 3. Kluger had found a consistent way to make our teammates run in the beginning of Ultimatum. This is something that the runners had struggled with for years. It just seemed like complete RNG and that nothing worked. However, he found out that alerting these enemies with a grenade launcher but then backing up until Price crouches down by this tree and only engaging after that was a sure way to make your friendlies run instead of walk. This is because your teammates follow certain movement patterns depending on the engagement you're in. By gauging the enemies at this precise time, we can manipulate our friendlies into thinking they're in combat, even if we later kill all the enemies. This causes our friendlies to run until they reach the door, where they are assigned a new movement pattern no matter what. This saves roughly 15 to 20 seconds. 
And last but not least, the new strategy on the level All In. Instead of using the Javelin like the community had done for over 5 years, Blue Target finally developed a faster way of taking out the two tanks. Blue Target did some testing and found that destroying the tanks with two C4s was faster than using the Javelin to do the job. This was a great discovery on its own, but during further testing with the same section, he also accidentally found an entirely new way to destroy the tank. Excuse me? What just happened? In this clip, Blue Target sprays into the crowd of enemies with his M4, but little does he know, he also sets a barrel on fire. And not just any barrel, he sets on fire this barrel, located at the entrance of one of the hangars, which the tanks come out of. When firing his first javelin, we can observe this little green indicator arrow disappearing, and an explosion being heard by our character. At first, Blue Target is unaware of what had happened, understandably so. Shortly after, he discovered that it was indeed the barrel that blew the tank up. This piece of information led him to develop an even faster strategy for destroying the tanks. The strategy has us use our C4 on this first tank on the left, and then proceeding on doing a quick swap to our M4. This allows us to blow up these explosive barrels just in time before the tank rolls up in front of them. Quick swapping requires some precise weapon swap inputs, but it is doable once you get the hang of it. Failing to do the quick swap and not blowing up the barrels costs us approximately 8 to 10 seconds. From this point forward, getting the world record would require the players to go all in. Okay, that was a terrible joke, but you get the point. The community fell silent once again, but with these major discoveries, it was only a matter of time until someone improved the time once again. But who would break the silence, and when? The answer to who? We would get 10 months later, when on the 13th of August 2021, I would be back with a run of my own. This time a 31 second improvement over the current world record, a 135.23. The only big thing this run brought to the table was a new way of destroying the MG nests on the sins of the father. We know from previous runs that destroying the nest has been popular either with the RPD or with the R700. There is another weapon that we had not considered, the G3. This weapon allows us to destroy the MG nests extremely fast. It takes the same number of bullets as the R700, but the G3 is full automatic and can dish out bullets a lot faster than the R700. Here is a side by side comparison of destroying the MG nest with the RPD on the left, the R700 in the middle, and the G3 on the right. As we can see, the G3 is the clear winner, finishing up after about half a second, while the R700 and the RPD finish just before the 6 second mark, with the RPD being slightly faster than the R700 in my testing. G3's time is just so astonishing that it is almost hard to believe. Now that we can use the God 3 for destroying the MGNS, we do not need to conserve any RPD ammo and can instead use it on making the earlier section safer by shooting most of the enemies. On top of this, clearing the nests can be done without even properly stopping to take cover. My run wouldn't last long on the top of the leaderboard, as a familiar face began de-rusting soon after posting it. Within a month of my run, Kluger would claim the world record back and steadily improve his time to a 134.46. There were no new major discoveries here, just better execution and a difficult strategy that had been known for a while now. The strategy that I'm talking about has the runner toss grenades at an important AI's feet, or just behind them, in order to get them to run, instead of doing a tactical slow walk. This can save tens of seconds over the course of the run, if executed correctly. The issue is, the AI can be troublesome to work with sometimes, and they will instead opt to run in the completely wrong direction, 
losing a lot of time for no reason. This is one of the biggest reasons why runners had opted out of using these strategies up until now. We have not yet dubbed this strategy a proper name, but in general it is just called grenading or nading. How original! These days, grenades are essential if you want to go for the world record, as it is just that optimized when it comes to pure execution. Unless new skips get found, most of the runs at the top level are now focused on improving your chances at good RNG. And just when you thought that we were done, we do have one more world record to mention in this video, and that is the standing one. Once again, 10 months later, from Kluger's latest Culture 4 world record, a Finn would beat Kluger's time. Can you guess who that might be? If you guessed me, you'd be wrong. So, whose time are we talking about? Whose? The runner is whose. Whose's run is most recognized by his efficient use of grenades and consistency in execution. He managed to beat Kluger by a margin of just milliseconds. 110 milliseconds to be exact. That is 6 frames if the run is recorded in 60 FPS. To illustrate how close these two runs are, I will show the Call of Duty 4 logo on screen for 6 frames. That is all that separates the current from the former, and who knows when we will get another name challenging the older ones. We're constantly looking forward to meeting new runners and helping them out with learning the Call of Duty games. I hope to catch all of you interested doing a run someday, and maybe even chatting with us in the Call of Duty speedrunning discord. The link is down below in the description. If you enjoyed this video and wish to see content regarding Call of Duty speedrunning with a sprinkle of creativity in between, consider subscribing. This has been How a Few Bounces Broke Call of Duty 4 Speedrunning. Thank you so much for watching, I'm Survivor and I'm out.